Hey guys, welcome back. It's Josh. Hey man, thanks so much for popping on. Listen, I've got a great guest today. Her name is Camilla Jeffs. Uh, she's an 18 year real estate investor uh, who started with very meager beginnings, actually living in a very poorly converted garage. Um, and we just have an absolute blast today. Uh, she is uh, been an investing now for 18 years, specializes in multifamily, specifically in the Phoenix and Tulsa, Oklahoma markets. She loves the impact that she can have on investors, especially investors with families. Um, and she's going to talk a lot today about her strategy and also some very specifics uh, about raising capital, which I found very valuable. Uh, so here's just some of what you're going to learn today. Number one, how to not overpay in a very hot market like Phoenix. Number two, how to make database decisions and some different databases that she uses to help her evaluate deals. Number three, how to invest with teams, right? Now, you don't always have to be the owner operator or lead sponsor, but how to invest with teams and also how to vet out those teams. Number four, the four main roles of a general partnership so that you can decide, you know, kind of where you fit in the, uh, you know, on the, on the dream team, if you will. Uh, also number five, how to have patience in multifamily. And she specifically says in this interview, uh, why so many people get tripped up by having marathon goals, but trying to accomplish them in a sprint. I thought this was very valuable. You'll love that piece. And finally, number six is the power of the first deal. Uh, so thanks so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to kick off 2022 uh, with a brand new guest and a brand new friend. Her name is Camilla Jeffs. Here we go. Welcome to the Accelerated Investor Podcast with Josh Cantwell. If you're looking to retire early with forever passive income, you're in the right place. This podcast is the go-to destination for real estate investors, both active and passive, and multifamily apartment investors, both new, intermediate, and advanced. Now, sit back, listen, learn, and accelerate your business, your life, and your investing with the Accelerated Investor Podcast. So, hey, Camilla, listen, thanks so much for joining me today on Accelerated Investor. How are you? I'm fantastic, Josh. So great to be here. Absolutely. So, Camilla, new year, right? 2022. Um, I'm always excited when I meet somebody new to talk about multifamily and kind of their money-making strategies and what they do and how they do it differently. So I'm curious, um, from your perspective, like, what are you working on now that you're really excited about? Uh, tell us about some of your goals for 2022 and just a tiny bit about the markets that you're operating in. Awesome. So 2021 was a fantastic year for me and my business. We just did a lot of business. We closed a lot of deals. We raised a lot of money and it was so fun to get people involved. Like I just love this group investing thing. It's just amazing. So I, I do large multifamily um, and then also some assisted living. So we can talk about that later too. But um, what I'm working on 2022, super excited about this, this coming year. Uh, working on, again, acquiring more large multifamily assets. And my two favorite markets right now are the Phoenix, Arizona market and um, the Tulsa, Oklahoma market. So those two markets are just fantastic markets for different reasons, right? So the Phoenix one, just heavy growth, just, I mean, explosive growth happening in the Phoenix market. Um, and then Oklahoma is just a really strong cash flowing market. And so I love both of those. So really working on those. And then also got some assisted living in the pipeline that we're going to build. So we're building assisted living kind of niche boutique style um, neighborhoods, basically, is what they are. And so we're building those in different areas around the country. So I'm excited about all these projects. Nice. Um, so let's peel back the onion real quick on assisted living. Just take a couple seconds here on that. When you say neighborhoods communities, like obviously a lot of people are familiar with the big box, big buildings, you know, hundreds yeah. of residents. What do you mean when you say communities and you sound like it's a different type of product? 
It is. It's kind of a boutique niche, you know, a smaller niche. Um, it's more, we're just trying to model out the, the feeling of home for, for our grandparents. Right. And so, you know, they move, it's a, it's an unsettling thing to have to move out of your home into a facility. Right. And, and we just didn't like the whole big box hospital theme, right? Just giant. There's so many residents. And so we thought, let's build something different. Let's really build more uh, neighborhood style. So basically we build like five big homes that have 10 to 15 bedrooms per home. And there's a full kitchen that we have chefs that come and then they, you know, make the meals for the residents. Um, and it's just a, uh, you know, it just feels like home that they're still, that they're right there in their homes. It's also oddly enough, very COVID friendly, right? Because we only have 10 to 15 residents per building that we can, it was really easy to, um, keep COVID away, right? Keep COVID at bay. And, uh, and so it's a really great model and it's one that's in high demand right now. The, uh, residents love it. The families love it for their parents to place them in, in these types of environments. Cause it's just a lot more homey. Yeah, that's interesting. You said COVID friendly, small homes, 10 to 15 beds, uh, because my favorite style of apartment to buy is garden style, small, small buildings on a big campus, you know, mm -hmm. 10, 12, 15 doors per building, as opposed to the large buildings that could have, you know, 80 or a hundred units under one roof. Um, I prefer to buy the whole campus be, and part of the reason because of that, right, our buildings that did the best in COVID were the ones where you could contain COVID within a building as opposed to infecting the whole complex. Yeah. So I love that strategy. Um, tell us a little bit more about how, how did you end up investing in Phoenix and Oklahoma and Tulsa? Was, was that intentional? Did you fall into it? Did you do a JV deal? Did you just, you know, vacation there? How did you pick the markets? <laughs> yeah, so Phoenix was simple because I lived there, right? So I, I lived in Phoenix. And when I decided it was time to level up into apartments, um, then I was living in Phoenix at the time. I'm like, okay, what can I do? How can I get involved? So started going to lots of meetups, meeting all the players, trying to figure out and navigate, figure out myself, how could I bring value to teams and how could I actually you know, get involved? So Phoenix was simple because it was my backyard. Now Tulsa was, is different, but it's also a little bit simple because because um, I have a brother who is a dentist in that area. And he kept telling me, he's like, you should invest here. It's cheap. <laughs> right now yeah. we know that that's not like a great reason to invest. Um, but he, um, but I started, you know, navigating that market and really trying to get to know that market and get to know the players in that market. And I just loved that I could have a diverse, um, uh, you know, diverse markets that they weren't exactly the same. They didn't follow the same thing. So, um, cause I'm, I'm a big fan of diversification and offering diverse opportunities to investors. Um, and so, so that's kind of how Tulsa and Phoenix came about. It, it was pretty simple. Yeah. I love it. Um, so tell us a bit more about your money-making strategy, like uh, specifically what types of buildings do you like to buy? How big, and what are you looking for in those buildings? And maybe describe Phoenix again, versus Tulsa. Is there a style of building an age of building? Um, and what are you looking to get out of it? Like what's the end goal I have a feeling you're going to say Phoenix is about appreciation and Tulsa is about cash flow. But <laughs> tell us from your perspective a little bit more about how do you structure deals? How do you make money so that our audience can get a sense of, okay, well, maybe I can invest with Camilla or maybe I can use some of her feedback to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about Phoenix first. So Phoenix is a, an explosive growth market. There are, it's been in the top 10 growth markets for years and years and years. Um, and if you study all the charts in Phoenix, it's just going to continue to grow. So many businesses keep moving in population growth just keeps coming. It's, it's always on, you know, the top 10 list for the U-Haul, you know, people buying U-Hauls and going one way to Phoenix. Um, so it's an, it's an amazing market for that. Last year, when we picked up our, our last asset in um, December, we closed in December in Phoenix, the year 
year over year rent growth was close to 25%. Oh, crazy boy. rent growth. So how do we make money in that market? Well, it's kind of easy <laughs> because it's, it, it's just, simple. it can be as simple as burning off the loss to lease. Now, it, you know, if listeners don't understand what that means, it just means that because we set, set a lease last year at a certain rate, this year's rate is much higher than last year's rate. And so we want to renew leases at this year's rate at the, at the fair market value, right? And it's not that we're just trying to increase rents. I don't follow that philosophy at all. Like, you you know, we want to do it intentionally and carefully and thoughtfully, right? About how we increase rents in markets. So in Phoenix, we look for B-class assets like the B-class because it's a, um, there's, you know, Phoenix, the people that live in Phoenix have quite a bit of money. They are, they are, they are well-educated. They have really great jobs. And so they need this, this B-class asset. Um, and we like to look for them in the path of progress too. And path of progress just simply means, is it located in an area where maybe they are building brand new class A assets around it? And if you build, if you buy the class B asset in a class A area, it's just will naturally appreciate, right? So we get, we get the advantage of natural appreciation, forced appreciation, and then just the, you know, the windfalls of, of all the, of the supply and the demand is is so off there that, um, that it's just a really great place to buy. Now, as far as uh, Oklahoma, right? In Oklahoma, we look for something different. Um, we're still looking for large assets. We still like the, the 100 plus style just because management is much easier and, and we can um, we can, I like having more doors under, you know, under one roof, but like you said, we have a, we follow a similar model in Oklahoma in that more the garden style. So one of the last assets we picked up, for example, had, has two buildings that have about 30 units in each building, but then there's a whole bunch of fourplexes that are kind of smattered around. Um, and the fourplex style was, it is in very high demand because, you know, you know, you don't have that many neighbors, right? You're not sharing that many walls with people. Um, and so they, um, that's a really great asset for us. And so we're kind of looking for a little bit more expansive areas in Oklahoma. And the other reason we like Oklahoma is because it's just really strong cash flow. Um, the cost of living there is uh, very low. And it's also uh, the other thing I love about it is that tenants are typically only paying 25% of their income towards rent, where in other markets like Phoenix, it's, a, it's at least 30%, right? So mm-hmm. it's really a lot more affordable for the, the tenants to live there and, and it cash flows really well. So there's no need to you know, go crazy on increasing rents. And, you know, we can do other things like we can charge for premium parking spots, right? And in in those communities, people like that. They want to be able to reserve a parking spot that's close to their door so they can just, you know, take their groceries in a little bit, not have to walk for forever. Got it. So help us, let me peel this back a little bit further, Camilla. Um, Phoenix, I imagine, because I guess here's the question, how do you avoid overpaying? Like, it almost seems like it's just a carte blanche check to just buy everything at any price and just wait for the, all this explosive growth to continue, right? And yeah. I no doubt that the growth in Phoenix is going to continue. All the flight coming out of California and the job growth and the weather and just all the amazing things that's going on in Arizona. But how do you keep things in check? Like, how do you manage risk when so much of this is, is it's not speculation. This is definitely, there's a planning process to it, but at the end of the day, there is a bet. Every investment is a a bet and you're betting that this growth continues. There's so much proof that it's going to continue that a lot of people just keep raising prices and probably selling at really low cap rates. So how do you manage that risk and how do you underwrite deals to really make sure that you're not just, hey, another property for sale. Hey, the growth's just going to continue. What's the price? Great, we'll buy it. You know, <laughs> how, how do you avoid that? Because I can think a lot of key people can fall into that, yeah, that temptation. Yeah, well, and and you have to be careful too that you're not buying a property that that will be a negative return in the first year too, because it, you you know if the prices are too high and then the debt is too high as well, and and you know and the money doesn't support it. Like it takes time 
for any value add project, it takes time. And so you have to really be careful that you are not overpaying. Um, and I think what, you know, one of the strategies that, that we use is just, um, you know, because my partners and I have been entrenched in Phoenix for a long time, um, it's a lot easier for us to get to get the deals and and get the ones that will make sense and get them first, right? I mean, it, it's a really like the Phoenix market. You've got to be first to the table if you're like tenth or fiftieth to the table. Prices are going to be so high that it doesn't make sense. And and you know you may you may think that you're going to be be okay, right? And you're like oh, that's kind of high, but I may, I'll, I'll I'll probably be okay just because Phoenix is growing so much. But that's a you have to make sure you're making database decisions. And that's what we do. We're heavy database decisions. So yes, cap rates are extremely low. I mean, sometimes we're, we're, we're in the low threes, high twos in the Phoenix area. Now that scares a lot of people with cap rates being that low, but we always underwrite like our last one we underwrote on, we, we, we set an exit cap of 4.8, right. And we were buying at a 2.9. So huge difference in the exit cap and because we wanted to make sure that it would make sense that, that if cap rates did start to decompress, that we would be okay in the end. And so we're underwriting with using a huge spread in the cap rates. Um, the other thing to, to keep in mind you know, to, uh, to, for the risk is that you have to look at past performance of the teams that you're investing with and what has been their past performance. And so you know, one of my favorite teams that we're investing with now, they've been like doing the same thing over and over again, right? Just rinse and repeat. This is the type of asset we buy. We go in and we buy it and then we assess it and then we sell it, right? And there's just they're just kind of repeating over and over and over again. And they've got such a fantastic model going that they can, that it does reduce the amount of risk in what you're doing because you're investing with experienced people who know what they're doing. Got it. Love it. Are you ready to automate and explode your real estate investing? We're searching for extremely motivated individuals who are sick and tired of wasting time and want to finally see real results from their real estate investing business. We're searching for investors looking to get to the next level and become a bigger, better version of themselves while being a more successful real estate investing entrepreneur. Apply for mentoring and coaching at joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. That's joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. So you mentioned database decisions, like what is your database made of? Everybody's evaluation and underwriting is a little different. So what are some of the different reports that you pull? Um, kind of this is really in the dirt, right? Just what type of reports, what you mentioned the U-Haul one-way trip report. That's a, that's mm -hmm. a great one. But database decisions, kind of define that and what kind of makes that up for you? Yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously we use CoStar. CoStar is a, a classic one that you, that you can use. And so that, and then also, you know, I actually love going to the Arizona real estate investors association. They have a once a month, they, they are the number one real estate investor association in the nation. So much activity going on there. And every single month they have these amazing reports that they give out and they give out tons and tons of data. And it's for any type of, of real estate investor. So they have fix and flip data that you can you can rely on you know, all the way to multifamily, large multifamily data. And it was interesting because many several years ago, when I was just starting on this journey and I joined that association, they said invest in multifamily. Like you've got to invest in multifamily. This is going, you're going to kick yourself if you don't invest in multifamily now. And look what has happened, right? Like, like they they've been studying the market for 50 years. The just the Arizona market. So I think having hyper local data from local people who are who've been you know in the intricacies of the market makes a really big difference. And and that's been kind of one of our secrets. Nice. Yeah, I love <laughs> right. it. The boots on the ground information, right? The the anecdotal feedback from people who are actually on the ground saying this is what we're seeing, not just something mm -hmm. that you're seeing a report which that report is hard to get very real time. Usually that stuff is 30, even yep. 60, 90, 180 days old. The real stuff that you're seeing on the ground 
it's tough to sound like to disseminate. Like, is that, did, what did he mean by that? Or what did she mean by that? Is that real? Like what, but then going on the ground and, 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 you know, vetting it out yourself is, is hugely important. I find that to be super valuable as well. Yeah. You mentioned Camilla investing with teams. So are you doing owner operation stuff? Are you raising capital, co-sponsoring, co-syndicating with other owner operators? Help me understand what you mean by invest with teams. Yeah. So my business model is to, is a co-sponsor type model. And so, which is why I can be diversified in multiple markets and multiple asset classes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I do. So part of, part of um, the value that I bring is I go out and I'm out there vetting teams, right? I'm vetting other operators and vetting lead, lead, lead sponsors and um, figuring out who has the best model. Um, and then th I bring that back and I go through like a, a huge vetting process for them, the market, the deal, um, I, and all those things. And then once I decide that, okay, yes, this is going to be a good opportunity. I feel good about it. At that point, I will release it to passive investors for the, have, give them the opportunity to invest in one of the, one of these deals. Got it. Love it. Um, let's back up a little bit, Camilla, and talk about your start, right? I know that you come from very meager, so like, like so many of us beginnings. Uh, I mean, so much so that you and your husband were living in a very poorly converted garage. Um, <laughs> yeah. so I'm interested to know about how this all started and some of the early challenges. Um, you know, you seem just very confident and in very um, kind of at peace with your style and your underwriting and your markets, but it probably wasn't always this way. It was probably very unnerving, crazy. So tell us about the early start and some early challenges that you faced and how you overcame those. Yeah. So yes, uh, I was young and married and dumb. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, That's two of us. Right. And, and, you know, we, we got, we got married young. We were uh, still going to college and like had no money. Really right. Young. Yeah. Really young. And we had literally no money. And so the only thing we could afford was somebody's like garage apartment that was like a detached garage and didn't even have a proper heater. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's bad news. But hey, you do what you you do what you can, and that's all we could do at the time. Um, and and the the person who owned it, she came to collect rent because she was old fashioned, and she would like stop by, and you know we'd like put our rent cash in an envelope and tape it on the door <laughs> to come grab right like that that style. But anyway, she came one day, and I I just took a took a minute because I was curious, and I just said, listen, I know you own a lot of properties is you have multiple you know, properties you go and collect rent from. How did you do it? How'd you get started? I was just curious. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she turned to me and she's like, well, you should buy a house. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, no. Like we're living in your converted crappy garage. <laughs> like, are yeah. you, you really think we have money to buy a house? And she said, no, listen, listen, you can buy a house that has like a basement apartment. You could rent that out and you should be paying like very little in your, in your rent, right. For the, for the month. And I was like, mm, I don't know. I was skeptical, but yeah, sure enough. That's exactly what we did. We decided to, we're like, okay, well, we'll scrape together some funds because if you buy something owner occupied, you can get it for very little down. And there was like all these home, first time homeowner programs at the time that we utilized. So we Let's actually bought closing, a house. Okay, financing, all these stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like very little down, really low interest rates. Well, at low at the time, I guess today's are way lower than what we got. But anyway, so we bought a six bedroom home, like this gigantic 3000 square foot place. We were living in like a 200 square foot thing, gigantic home and rented out the basement. And sure enough, we were paying like $150 a month to live there. And it had a pool in the backyard. Like oh, how cool man. was that? <laughs> we yeah. totally upgraded our living arrangement, but paid less than what we were paying in this, this crappy garage apartment. So that was the kind of an impetus for, okay, there's something to real estate. I really need to figure this out. So a lot of books and, and, you know, self-educating. And then, you know, we did a bunch of live-in flips. We did some small multis, right? So fast forward 15 years, I was kind of a burnt out landlord decided I, I need to do something different. I want yeah. to really get into multifamily. And so that's when I started getting into uh, figuring out how to get into multifamily 
had to go through some mindset shifts about, you know, cause I was a DIYer. We just did everything ourselves. Oh, sure. And so now I've got a shift to being a team player rather than a solo player. And how do you, you know, so had to work through that. Um, but I want to tell you about some of my early failures in multifamily, right? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to hear those. You mentioned so, getting ready for this about the first time you raise money. I know. So yeah. <laughs> that's the funny one. I'm dying to hear about that. Yeah. So as you're looking at getting into multifamily, so if you haven't, you know, made the switch yet, or you're curious about it, you know, really, I, I like to think of it in there's four main roles on a general partner team. There's an acquisition specialist, you have the underwriter, you have a person who brings the capital and then the asset manager. So as I was studying these roles, I felt like the most natural fit for me was the, was raising capital. Um, and so that's what I really started to hone in on. I mean, I learned all the others. I can do all the others for sure. Um, but I really love raising capital. So as I started, you know, getting investors and, you know, talking to people about it, everybody was interested and like, Oh yeah, I want to invest in real estate. I want to invest in real estate. Right. And so here I am thinking, okay, I got a bunch of people who are going to invest with me. So then I started networking with lead sponsors and I, you know, found a lead sponsor. I'd been networking with them for a while. I don't ever invest with someone unless I know known them for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, he's like, okay, you think you can uh, raise money? You know, you need to raise at least 500,000. I'm like, okay, yeah, I got this. I, I totally got this, right? I've, I've been talking to all these investors. They're all excited. And he's like, okay, great. So we go through the process and I launched the deal to my database and thinking, okay, here we go, right? I was excited. And one person invested $50,000. Oh, like, you know, Grant Cardone talks about 10Xing. Well, guess yeah. who negative 10 X her goal? Yeah. This girl right here. <laughs> right? Nice. Oh, it was so how embarrassing. Like, how did you, how did you circle back with the other general partner, the operator, oh. like depending on that money? Yeah. He was texting me daily. He's like, where's the money? Where's the money? What's happening? What? I mean, he was kind, right? He, he, he wasn't like mean about it. He was like, what do you need? What are you, do you need me to get on calls with investors? Do you need me to do stuff? Like, like he was interested in bringing that money in. Um, and I, I would, I tried to be so scrappy. I tried calling investors. I tried like, you know, emailed them a million times. I held a whole bunch of webinars. Like I was, you know, I, I did everything that I felt like I knew how to do to get that 500,000 and still ended up with just one 50,000 investor. And finally, at the end of the day, the lead sponsor is like, you know, I really can't bring you on as a general partner. Yeah. If all you got is 50,000. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and it was just, just complete failure for me. And at that point, I'm like, I I'm hanging my head and I'm thinking, is this not for me? Am I just not cut out to do this? Right. Like what happened? And, you know, when I was pretty, what, bummed you about it like, what, what, what were the takeaways? What, what are you doing differently now? And it's probably very psychological. I'm going to bet the way that you thought of it and how you presented it to investors is very different. A lot of the mechanics of talking to investors, holding webinars is probably similar. You held a webinar, you talk to investors, but it's the style, the delivery, the mechanics, kind of the setup of it all. Tell us what's different today and what did you learn? Yeah. And that's a hundred percent what happened. Right. So as I thought back about why, why did I fail? Like, why did people not invest? What happened? I realized that I was coming from a place of desperation and scarcity, mm -hmm. right? Like my mindset was it, it was all about me. I wanted to raise that 500 K I wanted to prove to that lead sponsor that I could do it. I wanted to break into multifamily, right? Like every thought process was just about myself and I realized, oh my gosh, Camilla, you're hundred percent wrong because the thought process needs to be about you're providing an opportunity to investors because the way I was talking about it was, oh, uh, I need your money, right? I need you to invest in this deal. And you're like, I need you, I need you. And, and I was trying to pull from them instead of framing it as oh my gosh, this is an amazing opportunity for you. You don't want to miss out on this. You know, yeah. like the way you talk about it, I was talking about it so wrong in the beginning. And now that I've flipped the script, like I've been able to raise millions and millions of dollars over, you know, in, in just a single year. 
And the, the reason is because I'm coming from a place of education. I'm coming from a play, a, a more humble place rather than a, I have to prove something to everybody yeah. in this world. Yeah. Like, let me show you something. And if this is right fit for you, what the funny thing is, is it's really a fit for everybody. Right. So yeah. it's really up here, like you said about how do you perceive it? How do you present it? Because um, I tell people all the time, look, if this isn't for you, no big deal. Like I, I've got other investors that will fund it. You know, I always mm -hmm. came from, even at the very beginning, kind of fake it till I make it. But I always was like, oh my God, I hope they invest. Oh my, I really need the money. But I was never going to allow that to come out. And yeah, yeah. it's worked. And my process is, you know, very similar. Like we do a lot of networking. We get a lot of referrals, we talk to a lot of investors. We kind of tee everybody up and go through multiple zoom calls get to know people really well so that when we finally do a webinar and do a raise like we oversell yeah. right because it's a lot of just this front end work that makes the commitment now we've completely turned the tables and i'm sure you've seen this where you have a webinar with 50 100 200 people on but you've only got room for maybe 25 investors now all the leverage is in your direction versus yep. the opposite. Like the first time you did it, you had zero leverage. So any, any other comments on that, like what you're doing today and kind of gaining leverage with investors to be able to come from a position of strength? Yeah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head, right? For anybody wanting to raise capital, there's so much work in the, on the front end, right? Before you mm -hmm. ever get a deal, you've got to be educating. And, and my focus has always been just massive education. Think through what does the investor journey look like? Like from the moment that they find you and then they reach out or you'll get in into your system somehow, how are you walking them through the process so that when you do have a deal, and they are just falling over over themselves to invest, right? And it was it was pretty incredible once I hit that point where I launched a deal, and sure enough, in 24 hours it was full, right? And I was like, "What just happened here?" I, and and it it was it you know I took a moment of gratitude just to realize that you know I'm so grateful for the journey that I've been on. I'm grateful I didn't quit in the beginning. What after that, you know, to me a massive failure, right? That that I could have just been like, no. Nope. I, I can't do it. I, I can't do it. Right. But no, I, I was able to work through that challenge and then get to a spot where I could fill a deal in 24 hours. It was amazing. Yeah. I love it. When people ask me, like say, Hey, Josh, I'm trying to raise money for this deal, whether it's resi or multifamily or big, you know, big syndications. They're like, but I'm not converting anybody. My answer to them is typically you're asking for the money too soon. Yeah. Right. The longer you can wait, the more you can delay, the more investors start to really, for lack of a better word, like kind of foam at the mouth, right? They're like, okay, I get it. I saw this deal. I saw this past deal. I saw that past deal. I'm sold. Yeah. Give me something to invest in. That's when things over now. And what you've really done is you've provided so much value up front to give them a good education mitigate risk as best as you can, provide them a secured investment that they understand that mm -hmm. then they look at everything else, stocks, bonds, crypto, mutual funds, some other syndicator, and they've, they've basically DQ'd everything else. And now they're like, I really want to park money in this deal with you, Camilla, or with you, Josh, bring me a deal, right? Now, again, you've got all the leverage in your way, but only because you did it the right way and put so much time in at the front end. That's the result of providing a lot of value and a lot of education. Um, one of my guys in my mastermind groups, a really good investor, but hasn't really raised a ton of money. And his name is Tony. And Tony's like, Josh, it's not working for me. I'm not. And I'm like, well, when are you like asking them to invest? He's like, well, at the second meeting. I'm like, dude, way too soon. <laughs> so, you know, that's so yeah. a piece of advice for all of us. In my newest real estate investing book, The Flip System, you'll learn the proven secrets and strategies that I've used to be a successful real estate investor. You'll also hear the story of my journey from quitting my job to doing over 2,000 units of apartments. The Flip System is now available for a limited time, and you can grab your free copy at getflipsystem.com slash podcast. You'll learn the same proven principles and secrets and investing strategies that I used 
to quit my job and pursue a life of financial freedom. In this book, I'm sharing exactly how I was able to personally close over 750 profitable real estate deals, make over 400 private lender loans, raise over $30 million, and acquire over 2,000 units of cash flowing apartments. Get my newest book now for free at getflipsystem.com slash podcast. That's getflipsystem.com slash podcast. What about Camilla? Any other just takeaways, not just about raising money, not just about real estate, but what kind of advice do you think you'd pass back to your younger former self? Or if you were mentoring someone, what would you, what are some takeaways from your journey that you would pass along to them? I think number one is just have patience, right? I mean, we all, we all get this anxiety about, you know, having things now. And I even, you know, I, I sent a, a you know, some, something out to my um, investors the other day about why new year's resolutions fail. And it's because we all set marathon goals, but then we want to sprint it. And we're not willing to just go a, a little bit at a time. And it's just, it's just really, literally, it's just one foot in front of the other, you know, you take it slow. Um, don't, don't have all this anxiety about it because that's why that's another reason I failed in the first place, right. I'm trying to raise capital. Cause I had anxiety about, oh my gosh, I got to get my first deal. And, you know, for those of you who are looking into multifamily, you know, the power of the first deal, right. It's important. It's definitely important, but have patience. Like there's no reason to rush into something. There's no reason to form a bad partnership just because you want a deal. Um, and, and so that's really what I would tell my former self. Like, there's no reason to have all this anxiety that I held inside my own head and, and really something I created inside my own head. I didn't need that. That didn't serve me at all. And in fact, it, it was the opposite of serving. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it did not help. Uh, and so that's the advice I'd give right now. Yeah. And to add on to that, like, you know, in multifamily and especially large syndications, the deals are so much bigger. You don't have to do tons and tons and tons of deals. Like we've done 18 large syndications, but you don't have to do 18 to make a massive financial impact on your own life and the life of a lot of other people. You could do one or two or right. four and have an amazing, amazing portfolio, right? So you can go slow. I love that. Having patience. You know, you said, I, I wrote this down, you know, marathon goals, but trying to accomplish them in a sprint. I thought that's very powerful. Um, so Camilla, let's, let's finish up with the final five. You ready for these? I'm ready. Okay. So real quick, so what's your favorite way to find deals? My favorite way to find deals? Well, I follow the co-sponsor method. So my favorite way is to lean on someone else to do it. <laughs> okay. Love it. What's your favorite way to find capital? My is favorite it podcasts, way to find webinars, emails, social media, networking? What's your favorite way to find capital? Uh, LinkedIn right now, actually. That's my favorite oh, way. Great. Tell me about that. How come? What, what, what's happening on LinkedIn that I need to know about? Well, I love LinkedIn. So I, I mean, I post on LinkedIn five days a week and uh, it's just a fantastic way to get investors. I mean, every post I put on there will reach eight to 10,000 views, right? I mean, there's eight to 10,000 people who are looking at what I'm saying and are following along. And then, you know, on, you know, just doing that consistently over and over. And I always do it story-based, make sure it's story-based. Um, it, that resonates with people a lot more than, than just saying, Hey, the market report says it's this and that, right? Like tell a story about it. Don't just, don't just give me facts and data. That's boring. Um, so LinkedIn has been a really great way for me. And then people just like, will DM you. And then, and then you start the conversation and you, and you, you talk to them. And uh, I can't tell you how many investors I've found on LinkedIn. It's, it's kind of a gold mine. Love it. Love it. Fantastic stuff. Um, Camille, who do you think's been the mentor for you? That's had the biggest impact on your journey. So the mentor for me right now is, has been Julie Lamb and Annie Dickerson. So they run um, Good Egg Investments and they were my mentors early on when I decided I was going to niche down and, and get really good at raising capital. Um, that's what they did. And I basically copied them <laughs> and, yeah. and it's been perfect. And, and just, you know, you just success leaves clues. You just follow the, in their footprints and, and then you're good, but they're, they are pretty, a pretty amazing team. Got it. Um, when is enough enough? Oh my 
gosh, I can't believe you just asked me that question. So in my mastermind group, we've been talking about this, right? When is enough enough or when, what's your definition of success? And I, you know, and I'll be vulnerable here with you because I don't know, right? Like I, I don't know I'm hardwired to achieve. And the, and it's something inside of me that just, you know, okay, I, I hit this goal, right? Like, for example, I did a half Ironman marathon and not marathon, sorry, half Ironman. And I'm like, okay, awesome. I achieved that. Do I ever want to do it again? No, Be, because I already achieved that, right? Like now what, now what do I do? What's the next big thing? What's the next big thing? What's the next big thing? And I think it, I don't think it's healthy. <laughs> and yeah. so I'm trying to figure out what is, what is enough, right? Like where, where is enough enough? Um, and I think just, I'm just trying to understand myself a little bit more, trying to understand that, you know, I think as long as I'm growing and learning every day, that should be enough, right? It should be enough that I, that I, I'm already successful, right? I can say that I'm already successful and, but I still want to grow and develop. And I, and I, and I love that. That keeps me alive and happy. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. I'm still pondering. Got another one for you. What, what's the definition of happiness to you? Oh, the definition of happiness is, is got to be very similar to peace, right? So having, having peace with who you are and, and what you are providing in, in the world, like what kind of impact are you making in the world? I think really brings a lot of happiness. Um, and for me, you know, impacting, simply impacting my family, like I have five children and, you know, growing a business and, and being active and going for dreams and shooting for big dreams and showing them the failures along the way, they know all my failure stories, right? They, they understand it. They, 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 they will, you know, cry with me and laugh with me, you know, mostly laugh at me, (laughs) you know, it's all good, but just, just showing them like dreams. Um, I think that's brought me an immense level of happiness because I see their minds working now. And I see them feeling like, because I've always say, if you have, as a parent, you want your kids to achieve big things. Like you look at your kids and you're like, oh my gosh, I just want everything for you. I want you to go after it. Like whatever you want to do, go get it. But if they don't have an example of a parent who's doing it, right. Mm -hmm. And living it, how do they know they can even attempt? Oh yeah. So, so it's a, it's something that's very core to me and brings me a lot of happiness to see, um, see my children trying to go after dreams too. Oh, I love it. Camilla, listen, thank you so much for joining us on Accelerated Real Estate Investor. I know that our audience would love to connect with you. Um, where are some websites, maybe your LinkedIn, where can they connect with you online? Yeah, please connect with me. I, you can go to my website, camillajeffs.com and you can you know connect with me there. Um, I have some materials there that you can download some information, right? But also LinkedIn's a fantastic place. You can just find me, just my name. You just type in Camilla Jeffs. There's not, I think I'm the only Camilla Jeffs around. I don't know, maybe Hopefully there's another one. <laughs> I, know, I don't have a common name, uh, but you can find me there, but that's a great place to connect with me as well. Awesome stuff. Camilla, listen, I had a blast getting to know you today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. This is awesome. So guys, there you have it, man. Wow. Camilla was powerful. A lot of, lot of nuggets there to take away. So I appreciate all of you listening. Listen, if you're looking to kind of take the next step, expand your journey into real estate and entrepreneurship and multifamily, uh, you listen, I put together this mastermind group. We've got over 40 members right now. We're going to build this group to a hundred members and this ecosystem, which I call the forever passive income mastermind. Uh, it's a lot more than a mastermind. It's actually quite a bit of a coaching program. We also partner on deals together. Uh, but you can apply to be a member of the forever passive income mastermind. You can apply at Josh Cantwell coaching.com. Uh, joshcantwellcoaching.com. When you apply, you're, and if you're accepted to join the group, uh, listen, you're going to be involved in an amazing ecosystem of owner operators, entrepreneurs, lenders, property managers, passive investors, underwriters. Again, all these main roles of a general partnership. I've got all of those people already in the mastermind. So if you're looking to basically kind of unplug from wherever you're at and plug in uh, to a group that's just really, really diverse and really growing. Um, And of course, I lead the group. 
Um, so you get the benefit of all of my years and years of experience in real estate. Check it out. Forever Passive Income. Uh, you can apply at joshcantwellcoaching.com. Uh, listen, also leave us some feedback. Man, Camilla was a great guest. A lot of great nuggets there. Please leave us a rating, review, you know, thumbs up, thumbs, whatever. Tell us how we did. I'd appreciate that. And we'll see you next time on Accelerated Investor. Hey, Josh here. And do you want to win a free Accelerated Investor t-shirt? All you have to do is give Accelerated Investor, our podcast, Accelerated Investor, a rating and a review on iTunes. Okay, do that now. Then send us a screenshot on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. What we're going to do then is every week we're going to pick our favorite rating and review and we're going to send that person a free t-shirt and maybe again some other cool fun stuff as well from Accelerated Investors. So again, don't forget to take a screenshot, leave a rating, review, take a screenshot, send it to us so we know exactly who you are and then once a week, every week on the podcast, we will announce a new winner. Don't forget to take a screenshot and send it to us so we know exactly who you are. We'll announce a new winner every week. You were just listening to the Accelerated Investor Podcast with Josh Cantwell. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something new, help us build the AI community by leaving a review and five-star rating on our iTunes podcast channel. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode. To see passive investing opportunities, visit freelandventures.com slash passive. To start your journey toward the lifestyle you've always dreamed of with multifamily apartments, apply for one-on-one -on -one coaching with Josh at www.joshcantwellcoaching.com.